This week at church, Pastor Robin McKinley continues his series, a series on love. And this is, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, it don't matter what's going on. It don't matter how crowded your life is. You come to me. You can join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for free coffee, free baked goods, a worship service, and a sermon to follow. The church is located by the Coventry Mall on Laurelwood Road. A couple weeks ago, I started a series of sermons based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In the first three verses, Paul kind of tells us that love is more important than spiritual gifts, knowledge, faith, generosity. And uh, then in verse 4, we looked at Paul telling us that love is patient, love has a long fuse, it is slow to boil. And he also tells us that love is kind. on this morning, love is kind. If you were describing our world, you would describe it, you probably wouldn't describe it as a kind world. So let's take a look at how the Christian really needs to stand out in this whole love thing. There was a woman who was standing at a bus stop and she had uh, just cashed her tax refund check. She had a whole pile of money in her purse. She really wasn't feel comfor feeling comfortable about carrying all this money. But she glanced over and saw the shabby dressed man standing nearby and as she watched she saw a man walk up to him and hand him some money and whisper something in his ear. She was so touched with that act of kindness she decided to do the same thing. So in a burst of generosity, she reached into her purse and took out a $10 bill and handed it to the man and whispered in his, in his ear, never despair, never despair. The next day when she came to the bus stop, there he was again. But this time he walked up to her and handed her $110. Dumbfounded, she asked, What's this for, he said, she said. He replied, lady, you won. Never despair, come in, 10 to 1. <laughs> now, I can't promise that acts of kindness will pay 10 to 1. But times of kindness might actually cost you nothing or even cost you something and require some sort of sacrifice on your part. But with this in mind, I'd like to take a look at a couple examples that are found in Luke chapter 8. So if you want to turn to Luke chapter 8, that's what we're going to look at today. And this is a past passage where we see Jesus showing kindness to two entirely different people. One is a man, the other is a woman. <coughs> One is an outcast, poor, unclean, the other one is more on the rich side, influential, a ruler in the, sin, in the synagogue. But yet Jesus treats them both the same. So by this time in the story, Jesus had gained a great deal of fame, and he was at the pinnacle of his popularity. Expected him as a healer and a teacher, and the crowds swarmed around him wherever he went. But despite his the pressures of popularity, despite the crowds constantly pushing in around him, Jesus, in his kindness, stopped everything he was doing to help them and to meet their needs. Cal Thomas wrote. Love talked about is easily ignored, but love demonstrated is irresistible. Jesus not only talked about love and kindness, but he modeled it for us as well. So let's look at how Jesus showed kindness to them. Point number one, I'm starting with your notes now. 
<clears throat> Jesus expect, exp, expressed kindness by them. In Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 40, And when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at his feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl, was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. He not only expressed, expressed kindness by listening to people, but he paid attention to their needs. You see, we have this thing that we can listen to someone, but we really don't hear what they say. So Jesus was doing both. He was listening and he was hearing what they were saying. As soon as Jairus came to him and told him about the daughter, the very next words we read is, as Jesus was on his way. It looked like Jesus immediately changed directions. <coughs> he started following Jairus because of the situation his daughter was in. As much as more pressing, uh, the crowds were against him. As much as he was headed in one direction, he immediately changed that direction and changed his schedule as well. Jesus paid attention to Jairus and um, as if Jairus was the only person on the face of the earth. Now keep in mind, all these people around him, all these people are pressing in. All of them probably had needs of their own. And yet Jesus says, I'm going to take care of this individual need. So Jesus was flexible and kind enough to meet another need. And as they were on their way, the scripture says in verse 43, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. <coughs> she came up behind him, touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, and I know that power has gone out from me. So there were crowds of people surrounding, pressing. Jesus was able to differentiate between a touch of the crowd and the personal touch of a woman who had a need. Now, I don't know what you're coming to. Let me read that the way it really is. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you need to press on to Jesus about. But in this imperfect world, Jesus wants to be personal with you. Jesus took time to stop in the midst of a crowd. Jesus took time to give a woman his personal attention as though she were the only one there. <clears throat> I've talked to people, especially about coming to church. You know, I'll come to church when I get my life all straightened out. I'll come to church when things are looking better on my end. And this is, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, it don't matter what's going on. It don't matter how crowded your life is. You come to me and I will personally take time for you. You sitting in your living room this morning, today, watching this television broadcast, you're thinking, the Lord doesn't want anything to me. I've got too many things going on. I've got, done too many bad things in my life. <clears throat> That's a bunch of hogwash that he doesn't want anything to do with you. He's there for, and he'll set about his time personally, spend it with you. And the same with everybody in this room. Jesus expressed kindness by being considerate to others. The scripture goes on to say in verse 47, When the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, <coughs> I like to think of this as, the woman, seeing that she got caught, <laughs> okay. 
came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. We need to realize that because of her disease, she was labeled unclean. She was an outcast. They treated her the same as they treated somebody with leprosy. And because of that, she hadn't been living with her family for 12 years. Her self-esteem must have been as low as it could possibly be. So Jesus surprises her, first of all, by stopping and listening to her story. You know, we probably got the condemned version. Think, keep in mind, she hadn't had opportunity to actually sit and talk with anybody for any amount of time. So this could have been a longer conversation than what we have in the Bible. I mean, this was the first time in how many years? So I imagine that she poured her heart out to Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? He stood there looking around the crowd, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. No, no. No, he probably looked her right in the eye with a smile on his face and listened to what she had to say. Are you a good listener? Are you a good listener? We pass each other and we'll say, how are you? And we automatically expect someone to say, I'm fine. Have you ever been caught off guard and someone tells you exactly how they really are doing? Well, one person recalls that he once said to a lady, how are you? And she replied, you don't want to know. And in his mind, he was thinking, lady, you're right. <laughs> I don't want to know. I really don't have the time to listen to you. Because hurry. Else. I think that can be true with a lot of us. You know, most people really think, uh, really don't take time to listen. Paper columnist Irma Bombeck, she breathed a sigh of relief one day as she had gone through security and gotten to her gate at the airport. And she thought, man, I've got 30 whole minutes. I don't have to listen to anybody. I can just sit here, read my book, and not be bothered at all. But no sooner <coughs> had she opened her book <clears throat> when an elderly female said to her, I'll bet it's cold in Chicago. I suppose, Irma replied, without looking up from her book. I haven't been to Chicago for three years, the woman said. My son lives there. That's nice, Irma said. The woman continued, my husband's body is on this plane. We were married for 53 years. Drive, you see. And the funeral director was so nice, he drove me to the airport today. Irma recalled, her voice just droned on. Here the woman who didn't want, was a woman who didn't want money. She didn't want advice. She didn't want counsel. All she wanted was someone to listen to her. And in desperation, she had turned to a total stranger with her story. Well, Irma said she continued to talk to me till they announced that we were boarding the plane. She says, we walked onto the plane and I saw her sit in another section. And as I hung up my coat, I heard her say to the person next to her, I'll bet it's cold in Chicago. You know, there are so many of us, we just need somebody sometime to listen to us. Just focus on us and listen to what we have to say. You see, Jesus did that on that day. All these people pressing in, all these people wanting some of Jesus' time and attention, and he focused on this lady. Well, Jesus expressed kindness, though more than anything. Jesus expressed kindness through an understanding spirit. 
keep in mind, we don't know how long this conversation took, but what we do know is Jesus was going in one direction and turned direction to go to Jairus' house because Jairus' daughter was sick. Well, verse 49 says, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, your daughter is dead. Can you imagine how Jairus thought, felt? We, we get a sense of that with Mary and Martha with Lazarus. You know how, Jesus, if you'd have just come sooner. And maybe Jairus felt the same thing. Man, if this woman wouldn't have taken his time, if he would have just got there sooner. They said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. She'll be healed. And when they arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with, <coughs> with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. And he took her by the hand, said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Well, let's concentrate on these last few verses. The miracle is exceptional. Anybody who loses a child to death and is able to take that child to the kitchen and feed them, something great has happened. But notice what Jesus told them after the miracle was over. He says, just don't tell anybody about this right now, okay? Some of the most disturbing words in the English language are four words that some of us like to speak, but most of us hate to hear, is, I told you so. Some really think it's fun to speak them, and they relish it when they're the ones who are saying it. I told you so. It's very difficult to listen to them, isn't it? I mean, sometimes, and my wife doesn't do this, but sometimes I'll, I'll say it for her. Okay, go ahead. I told you so. She'll say, I wasn't going to say that. And I know she wasn't going to say it. But it just made me feel better that somebody said it. <laughs> now remember, the people outside, outside of the house, they mocked Jesus as he was coming in. They laughed at him. They laughed at him because she was dead and he wasn't going to take dead for an answer. He went to raise the girl back to life again. You know, the kindness of Jesus extended to everybody, not just Jairus and his family, not just the woman amongst the crowd, but amongst these mourners too. Jesus' kindness was extended to them as well. You see, I just wonder, if we were Jesus, how many of us would have done this? We would have raised the girl back to life, and then taken her by the hand, walked her out, outside, up in front, uh, up and down in front of the mockers, and said, I told you so. There's nothing wrong with her. I told you. <clears throat> but Jesus didn't do that. He was concerned not only about the family and the sickness of this little girl, but he was concerned about the people outside as well. He didn't even try to get even with them. He didn't go back to talk to them. Instead, in his kindness, he tells the parents, don't go out there and tell these folks this. Don't put them down in shame, is what he's saying. They don't need to know that right now. Sometimes it's not so much what you say, but it's how you act and how you say it. See, one preacher said, I've never had to apologize for my position, but I have oftentimes had to apologize for my disposition. Have you ever had to apologize for your disposition? Yeah, I have to. I have to. Well, I love this story, and you're going to like it too. There was a uh, six foot ten cowboy who walked into McDonald's, standing at the counter, slammed his fist down, and said to the girl behind the counter, I want half of a Big Mac. 
She says, what? He said, I want half of a Big Mac, and I want it now. <clears throat> Not sure what she should do. She said, excuse me for a moment. And she headed to see the man. But she didn't realize that this big six foot ten cowboy was following her. She got to the manager and said, there is a big cluck over there who's dumber than lead and has ordered half of a Big Mac. And just at that moment, she realized that he was standing right behind her, and she quickly added, and this gentleman wants the other half. <laughs> Sometimes you may be put on the spot, and what you say is important. How you say it can be even more important. The fact that Jesus didn't want to embarrass those who were mocking him or even get even with them speaks volumes and teaches us how we're to respond to each other. You see, love is kind. Kindness to each other is a very tangible way to show the love of God. You see, you can say, I love you, all the time. You can say it, and it might not carry any weight at all behind it. But you can't say, I kind you. No. That's something that needs to be demonstrated. So friends, let's be kind to one another, even as God has been kind through Jesus Christ and offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Let's be kind, even if it takes a little extra time out of our schedule, even if it takes a sacrifice on our part. Kind to another, because kindness is an act that has to be demonstrated. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Be kind and another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Friends, be kind and compassionate. What's, what's that saying? That's saying, be kind by showing love. Not be kind by telling love, but be kind by showing it, forgiving one another. Where are you at today in forgiveness in your life? Are there people that you need to forgive? I know I have emphasized this pretty strong this year, but forgiveness is so important because the Bible says we we can see we love people and that comes from being kind who we can see because how can we love a God who we can't see you see we're all his creation we were all created in the image of God. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. You're not better than the person sitting beside you. And we need to be at a place where we're kind and compassionate, forgiving. Scripture goes on to say in Colossians chapter 3, some people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourself with compassion. Again, clothe yourself with love. But it goes on. Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and peace. This portion of scripture is saying, doesn't matter what. You see, we'll say, well, I don't need to be nice to that person until they... Or that person, the way they treated me, I don't want anything to do with that person. 
And what that's saying is, there's not humility. You've already broken the chain. That's pride. The scripture says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility. See, when pride gets in the way, it strips you of the other things. And you're seen as you are. And the last thing we want in our lives is to be seen as we are. You see, we want to be seen as Christ makes us. So clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Where are you at today? Does kindness need to ring forth in your life? Does kindness need to be the next step up from compassion in you? Because I understand it's hard to show kindness if you don't have compassion. It's got to come first. And then those tangible things. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Stand with me, if you will, this morning. I'm not sure what the Holy Spirit's speaking in your heart and your life right now. But I don't doubt that he is speaking something. He might be speaking different things to different people. What's going on in your life? Maybe this morning as Chris leads us in a song. And you need to work some things out with God. Don't dampen the Holy Spirit this morning. Do what he is speaking to your heart. And ask God to intervene in your life.